Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Brown Bag Lecture, put on by the Penticton Museum every Tuesday from noon till one. Uh, starting in September, taking a, and going till December, taking a break for Christmas, and then we start up again in January and go until the end of March. So certainly glad to see everybody come out. I'm really excited to hear about this ecological treasure known as antelope brush because it really uh, is a, a real indicator of the Okanagan, and it's a very special plant. So without further ado, I'm going to get Don Gaten to come in and. Tell us about this wonderful plant. One last thing. If you don't mind, if you have a phone and you want to turn it to quiet, then we can have no interruptions. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. How's my, how's my volume? Well, welcome. Uh, this is a pl great pleasure uh, to give me an opportunity to talk about my favorite, well, second favorite plan. Uh, <laughs> we won't go into that. <clears throat> so, antelope bitterbrush suffers a number of, of uh, difficulties. One of them being is that it seems to have any number of names. Uh, Antelope bitterbrush, antelope brush, black sage, greasewood, you name it. Uh, I find antelope bitterbrush quite a mouthful, so I'm uh, going to call it antelope brush, even though no antelope has ever set its delicate little hoof in the province of British Columbia. So it is what it is. Uh, So the other thing that it suffers from is that it's got a couple of look-alikes, Wyoming Big Sage and Rabbit Brush. Uh, these are three uh, shrubby species that are typically go about this high uh, and are found in very similar dry habitats, dry hillsides, uh, grasslands, and open forests. Uh, you can distinguish them um, basically because wild big sage and rabbit brush before it flowers have that grayish color, uh, whereas, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the animal brush is a kind of a pale green color. And it is interesting in that it's, I never heard the term before, it's semi-deciduous or semi-evergreen. So it loses a few of its leaves every year, but other leaves are, are uh, over winter. I'm kicking myself because I have a plant in my front yard and I was gonna bring a branch of it, and of course I forgot, uh, but too many other things going on. Uh, it has a number of indigenous uses. Uh, Besides being a ceremonial plant, it was used in a, for a number of uh, medicinal and, and other... Uh, and it's interesting, it was a, a traditional medicine used to treat a, a Western affliction, gonorrhea. Uh, uh, this is from, uh, from the state of Montana. Uh, there are other sources of information about uh, indigenous uses, but, but this is one that I consulted. Uh, it has an interesting uh, naming history. Uh, Frederick Persh, who I'll go into a little bit later, uh, uh, cataloged Lewis and Clark's botanical collection. And this was an unknown species uh, to Westerners at the time. It was collected somewhere in Montana, and Persh uh, identified it and named it Tigarea tridentata. Uh, but after he died in honor of, of his work, 
it was changed to Persia, honoring his, his last name. Uh, so one of the really key factors in the ecology of these southern, the southern interior valleys, you know, the, the Okanagan Valley, the Similkameen Valley, the Kettle Valley, the East Kootenays to a lesser extent, is that they're the very northern tip of what we call the Great Basin Biome, which extends all the way down through eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, into Utah, Nevada, Montana, all the way down almost to Mexico, and in some cases, uh, part of that. There's any number of species that you can look at the distribution map and attract a very similar uh, geographical area as antelope brush, as Wyoming big sagebrush, a whole host of other species, including insects, birds, mammals, uh, reptiles, you name it. And one of the reasons that this uh, South Okanagan area is so full of species at risk is because we're at the very northern tip of the Great Basin biome. So we have species living here that are comfortable in Nevada and, and Utah and places like that uh, and are fairly common to the south of it. So that's an important element, and I think one of the reasons we need to be aware and focus on the fact that we're at the very northern tip of this biome is the genetics of the species at the very northern edge of their range are very diverse and variable because they are living under conditions that are not ideal. So they're more flexible. Uh, their genetics have a, a broader spectrum of tolerance so that those genetics compared to say in the middle of the of a species range are very important, particularly as our climate is changing so rapidly. Um, so the other fascinating thing about this plant is its distribution, uh, particularly here in BC. So, I'm sure you're all familiar with eFlora BC, uh, which is the catalog of all of the plants in British Columbia, and it maps where they're found. And you can click on each one of those little dots, and it'll tell you who found it, when, uh, and uh, some other, other information. So you can see it's, it's focused very much around Osuyus, uh, a little ways up uh, and some north of Kelowna and there's some actually if you're on Highway 97 uh, I think it was the third stoplight before you cross the bridge if you're sitting there waiting for the light to change there's some bitter brush or antelope brush right next to the highway uh, so little pockets so it's a very curious distribution and one of the really curious things for me is there's never been any found in the Snoqualmie Valley. And I, I, that's a mystery. Uh, there is a silk explanation for that, but um, I'm always looking for an ecological explanation, but I haven't found one. So how many of you use iNaturalist? It is amazing. Uh, just Google iNaturalist British Columbia and you can put in anything from a butterfly to a mule deer and it will show you distribution, uh, lots of information about it. Uh, and it's one of those things that, that volunteer naturalists contribute to. and. You know, they're, they they kind of grade, you know, whether you're an expert or an amateur and so on. And, and they'll let you know, you know, if, if this location was done by an expert or an amateur. But 
uh, it's a profoundly useful, very new uh, website that I'm just still getting used to. But here's an example of uh, iNaturalist. And you can see far more um, location identifiers than in eFlora BC. So it's, uh, and um, it extends all the way up to Vernon, but it's just like one or two plants. And that's as far north as it goes in all of, of the Okanagan. <laughs> Again, nobody in iNaturalist has found anything in this no Uh One or two instances over in the boundary country. And then the other unusual thing is here it's fairly common in the East Kootenays where the summers aren't as hot, the winters are much colder, and yet antelope brush <coughs> is fairly common there. It tends to be quite a bit shorter than the Okanagan, but it's found all the way up to Canal Flats. So another uh, ecological puzzle for me to, to, to uh, keep me uh, intrigued with this species. Uh, feel free to, if you've got any questions, to uh, uh, shout them out or raise your hand or whatever. Uh, so, Say again? Uh, my wife always tends to ask these awkward questions. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've heard that it doesn't belong there, but the reasoning behind it, I don't know. Uh, so. Yes. John, is creosote bush related or is it a different? That's a different species, but it's again a dry site, um, shrubby, uh, and it's, you don't have to go very far across the line before you start seeing it, but it is a totally different species. Okay. So it's yeah. not, in, not in BC? No, no, but, for, but you know, in, in 30 or 40 years, if we're, the planet is still surviving. <laughs> It, it, it could potentially be moving northward. Yes? When we're looking at this map, it, it appears as if the uh, antelope brush likes uh, valley bottoms. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. John, do you mind just repeating the question? Oh, sure. Um, this is a good example of how both of those maps show that it's a valley bottom creature. Uh, a little ways up the hillsides. Unfortunately, you know, all the level ground in our valley bottoms is now either a city or a, a vineyard or, or whatever. Uh, it'll go up, I found it up to eight or 900 meters, uh, but it's typically valley bottoms and, and hillsides. One of the interesting things, uh, we live in Summerland and as you drive from Summerland to Penticton, and then south, it's all silt. And there's lots of rabbit brush, there's lots of wild big sage, absolutely no antelope brush. If you keep going south past Penticton, uh, at the old game farm, you start seeing it again. And then it'll start and stop and start and stop. So it'll grow in sand, it refuses to grow in silt for, for whatever reason, I, I don't know. Uh, but it, it is particular, and it won't grow in really shallow soils above bedrock. Wow. Yes? You call it an icon of the uh, basin mile of the setting? It's representative of this vast geographical area and representative of probably a, a several hundred species that are common to the south of us and uncommon or fairly rare uh, in our southern interior valleys. So 
You could choose other icons, you know, the rattlesnake, the Wyoming big sage. Um, yeah, there's a bu bunch of them, uh, but uh, as a kid, I grew up in Southern California, and so I'm, you know, some of these things I kind of remember from from my childhood. Uh, so regeneration of antelope brush is becoming a pretty important topic all of a sudden because we're realizing that, okay, we've already lost a lot of antelope brush to residential, agricultural, and urban development, but we're also losing it uh, from other, uh, other reasons, which I'll go into later. Uh, so that's what the seed looks like. Uh, has a little husk and then that little black seed inside. Uh, it's important to remember that it's highly self-incompatible, which means that if there's only one plant, it's probably never going to, its seed will never be uh, viable. It needs to have a, uh, a community around it. <clears throat> Uh, the pollination is mainly by insects, uh, and it's a it's a um, it's a long time between the seedling stage and the stage where it's uh, able to produce viable seed. What's the seed dispersal? Uh, he wants to know the seed dispersal. I'm just into that topic. <laughs> Forgetful rodents are the key to antelope brush regeneration. Rodents will harvest the seed in the fall and they will even husk it. They'll take that covering off and then they'll go and, and dig a little hole and put all their seeds there and then bury it again and thinking. Then they come back in the spring and they think, where did I put that? And so that is, one of the primary ways that antelope brush regenerates is for forgetful rodents. So that's, an, that's a rodent cache that has just exploded into a bunch of seedling. Uh, and then a little further on where you can see uh, the seed leaves are pretty much oval shaped and the next set of leaves have that kind of three stubby finger shape to them. Uh, this is a lovely photograph of the next sort of stage and, and Jeff Braze gave it to me. He's a, a grad student at UBCO studying antelope brush regeneration. So there is, uh, there's kind of a community of interest including the First Nations, UBCO, Canadian Wildlife Service and others that are starting to really focus on this species. And then here's a, a seedling. I mean, you very rarely see a seedling. What you're usually seeing is mature and overmature plants. So a, another topic that I find quite fascinating is that animal brush is a nitrogen fixer just like alfalfa or clover, it hosts its own nutrition by maintaining a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria in the roots that is able to take nitrogen out of the air and in exchange for other nutrients that it gets from the plant, it gives back its ex excess nitrogen. So uh, that is a, a hugely important element in these dry hillsides that are, that are nutrient poor. So it, it not only is financing its own nutrition, it's providing extra nutrition for other uh, plant species in the, in the immediate vicinity. So on to butterflies. Two species that 
if they don't have ammo brush, they don't survive. They're what's called obligates. Um, and I'm no expert. Uh, um, we should actually try and get somebody to talk about butterflies. Uh, these two are fascinating, and, and the you know the bear's hair streak, which is federally red listed, is kind of blah. But this one's spectacular. The not all sheep moth. It's not a butterfly. It's a moth. Uh, but these two feed on and require uh, ammo brush for reproduction. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's over my head. What, what do they What do they eat? I think, if I understand correctly, and I, you know, I'm, you, I could be completely wrong. I think they will nectar on other plants, but they have to have antelope brush for reproduction. Uh, and if anybody knows, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's my understanding. Uh, so you, some of you may recognize the names there. Sylvie Desjard or Desjardins uh, is a prof at UBCO. And Dennis St. John is a great friend of mine that was uh, um, kind of the foremost entomologist in this area until he moved to, to the coast. Uh, but uh, a, a wonderful individual. Uh, So you can see that they're not only obligates of animal brush, it has to be of a certain age. Uh, so. And it may be that the larvae is the, is the key stage that the larvae have to have the animal brush to feed on. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, So then there's this weird thing that, that um, at some point I'm going to dive into that ants have this relationship to the butterfly larvae where they, the larvae produce little exudates and the, and the ants eat the exudates and then they do something, they give something back to the butterfly larvae and I'm thinking this is so weird it sounds quite fascinating. Uh, so I. I definitely want to dig into that one. But ants are also seed harvesters of, of antelope brush. Uh, so uh, it is a, it, it is a, a, a very fascinating plant. Yes? Does it take 30 years for the plant to come to maturity? Uh, no, it becomes, um, it can re reproduce at about 10 years of age after uh, 10 years old. Uh, yeah, and I, I think, let's see, I'll back up. Uh, I'll get into this a little later. I, you know, animal brush in this part of the world, a 70 year old plant is, a, is old growth. Um, Across the line, places like Montana, they, they found some that are 100, 110, 120 years old. But I, my very limited assessment here is that 60, 70, maybe 80 years old, and it's, it's, uh, um, it's the very end of its life cycle. Yes? I'm sure glad you asked that question. I will get to it shortly. <laughs> Uh, it's a very nutritious forage for a whole raft of different species. Uh, and it's, again, because it's, it's stiff and upright, it stands up above the snow and, and uh, retains those nutrients. Uh, you know, it's an acquired taste. It has a, a, a very bitter, um, taint to it, but a number of large mammals
feet on it. So here's the issue that is really confronting us as ecologists in the southern interior that it's kind of like us. You can't live with fire, but you can't live without it. Uh, and it's this profound challenge that we kind of have to address, not only for bitter brush or animal brush, but also for ourselves after we've gone through some of these really extreme fires. Uh, so, antelope brush cohabits with ponderosa pine up to a point, but if there's too much ponderosa pine, it shades out the antelope brush and it, 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 it declines. Um, Lori Daniels is this incredible prof at UBC that has done some really remarkable fire history studies in Southern Interior using this uh, methodology called dendropyrochronology which is basically you're dating fire stars on standing trees and also on stumps and so on. Because as you know, uh, trees produce a growth ring every year. If a tree experiences a fire, burns a, what we call a cat face, doesn't kill the tree, but leaves, uh, it burns into the wood, then subsequent fires will leave a scar as, it, as the tree grows. And that has become a profoundly useful tool for us to determine, okay, what was the fire history like in the southern interior in these valleys prior to European arrival? And this is where uh, Laurie and Alexander Pope did their study. So, okay, Falls is just up north here. This is Vassal Lake. They took this whole west side uh, and found a whole raft of fire scarred trees, took them back, cut cookies, took them back to the lab, did all the sanding work so you could tell the rings, and this is the result, which summarizes hundreds and hundreds of hours of work, but it shows a very definite trend in prior to European settlement, lots of frequent sort of individual fires you can tell like this fire was obviously a big one because it burned almost every tree whereas these are smaller fires uh, that uh, were not nearly as intense so this kind of divides it up into the traditional burn and we we can't really go back much to about 1650 is as far back as we can go because Trees in the interior just don't live much longer than that. They, they, uh, they're not like the coast where you can find a thousand year old tree. <clears throat> so, uh, and then this era, you know, of early settlement, uh, railways, mining, and coupled with pretty extreme drought, particularly in the 1920s, some pretty extreme fires, and then uh, in here, and then fire suppression beginning pretty much right after World War II. It was Smokey the Bear uh, put fires out by 10 o'clock, and now 70 or 80 or 90 years later, we're dealing with the consequences of total fire suppression, huge amounts of fuel accumulation, and then the side impacts, ecological impacts of, we're starting to lose a lot of antelope brush habitat because of forest ingrowth and encroachment. Uh, so Dr. Daniels is continuing to work in that last Vassal area. She's got a couple of grad students now who are who just started their work this spring. Uh, And uh, I hope that we can get them to, to give a, a uh, brown bag talk at some point because they're doing some very interesting research.
And this is uh, Mia and, and Gracie with their two uh, technicians doing uh, field assessments on West Vaso. So, uh, unfortunately this area is hard to get to. You have to park quite a long ways away and then walk on the old KVR trail, but it is a, it is a lovely area. Uh, it's, it's owned by the Canadian Wildlife Service, who uh, they, they spend all their time in their office. I don't know why that is, but they, you, know, you never see them out there. That was an editorial comment. Uh, so this is the Nature Trust Animal Brush Conservation Area, which is just north of Gallagher Lake. Uh, you know where that BC Hydro uh, substation is, uh, all the way up to the Sorco uh, entrance. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a hold of some really excellent 1938 aerial photographs of the South Okanagan. Uh, I kind of wonder what kind of an airplane they were flying to, in 1938. But uh, anyway, if you look closely at, so here's the highway. If you look closely at, you know, there's a little bit of ponderosa pine in through here. Now look at it, and, and that's 2019, and I'm sure it's continuing, but. This is called, uh, you know, when, when an existing forest densifies, we call that forest ingrowth. When uh, the trees start moving out onto traditional grasslands and shrublands, we call that encroachment. And that's what's going on. Both of those processes are going on throughout the South Okanagan. It's quite visible here. This was a cigarette fire in, I forgot what year. It's pretty obvious. Uh, and we were out there uh, this spring, uh, and there's just a tiny bit of regeneration there, but very, very little uh, regen of animal brush. So it, it is a challenge. Uh, that's the hydro station right there, so you can see that as you're driving along. And this is a, the four-lane stretch here. <clears throat> so the question about age. Uh, it is amazing, yeah, you can date uh, the age. So I took this cookie from a dead plant on the animal brush conservation area sanded it down, and it's not a very good picture, but you can kind of see those individual rings. Uh, and that was about a 35-year-old plant, and it was a pretty good-sized stem at, at that point. Uh, so that's kind of a mid-range age, uh, but it, the technology is there to date these. Senescent. Uh, well, I'm a good example, you know, at, at age 77, I'm senescent, so... Uh, 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 yeah, it's declining in uh, viability or something like that. Uh, you know, there's a a huge amount of research about animal brush south of the line, very, very little here in BC. Uh, and it only grows in British Columbia. It doesn't grow anywhere on the prairies or in eastern Canada. And it is a species that I think we have ignored uh, for too long. And I think we're starting to, we're in catch up mode at this point, which is, which is good. Uh, I just recently got to know Ariel Vernon, who lives uh, just west of, of Oliver. Uh, 
on the Willowbrook Road, and her land is adjacent to some natural habitat of ponderosa pine and antelope brush, but there's a big hay field there that uh, she is hoping to reestablish antelope brush and associated native vegetation in that hay field. And she's working with some uh, grade school students in Oliver to do this uh, kind of barefoot research, uh, which I think is profoundly important. Uh, and the kids are learning a little bit about manual labor and, and, and about the ecosystem at the same time. So uh, you can see this was the old hay field, but just right up here, there's antelope brush and ponderosa pine. Uh, a lot of us think that antelope brush really has a potential as a landscape plant. Uh, because it's native, it's drought tolerant, it's long lived, uh, it is semi deciduous. Uh, so, this is Don and Judy's uh, plant right in front of our house. Uh, it's about head high now. Um, I quite love it. It's it's just I meant to bring a snip, but I totally forgot to to do that. Um, it has lovely tiny little flowers uh, in the summer. It has kind of a a scent, a very mild scent about it. Uh, one of the difficulties that I found in landscaping is that, like a lot of native species. Uh, it tends to sprawl and droop. And that's because we water it too much and we give it too much fertilizer and, and watering. But life is short and you want to keep it. So, uh, you know, I, I do prune this a little bit, you know, these, like that branch there, and then, and then snow press keeps pushing it down. One of the ways that it regenerates, actually, is a branch like that, if it gets pushed down enough, onto the ground, it will, I forgot the word for it, uh, it'll layer and create new, new, not, uh, some genotypes won't do it, but others will. So uh, that is another uh, reproduction method. And this is uh, from my, my friends uh, with Sage and Sparrow, or, uh, yeah, a nursery up in, in Kelowna that they've been experimenting with it. Um, but, uh, you know, by all means, if you do plant antelope brush, plant two of them so that they can cross pollinate. So, so now into this bizarre, complex uh, species at risk classification, which I spent some time with, and I've never quite really figured it out, but here are the various categories. Uh, and this is, uh, there are two separate uh, endangered species ranking. There's the provincial one and the federal one. And they, they intersect on some species, but not all of them. Uh, and oddly enough, the plant itself is S4, S5, apparently secure, demonstrably widespread, unabundant and secure. But all the plant associations of antelope brush curry sand grass, antelope brush needle and grass, antelope brush blue bunch are S1 and S2. So I've never been able to figure that out. And I often wonder if this was a political decision uh, rather than an ecological one. Uh, this is probably the most common plant association that you'll see, but uh, this one's fairly rare and I think it's only over in the East Kootenays. Uh, that's relatively common. This is quite uncommon. But wouldn't it be just simpler to say antelope brush 
is Red List and these plant associations. I, anyway, uh, maybe somebody can explain that to me, but I've never been really able to figure it out. So this is an example of a grandfather antelope brush. I'm not going to tell you where it is, uh, but its footprint is like the size of a living room. It, it's enormous. Uh, and probably it should never get like this because any kind of a fire that's going to go through will, will, will kill it completely. And there, there's the trunk and it's like, yeah. Uh, so, because I forgot to bring a branch, I'm going to show you, if you want to look at antelope brush, if you want, are not familiar with it and you want to see one up close, uh, the way station just by the intersection there of Highway 3 and, and uh, 97, if you pull into that parking lot and then walk up in either direction, there's actually antelope brush on both sides of the highway there. Uh, but you can see it, it's, it's not a, not a, it's not a pristine situation, but you can see animal brush there. The other place, which is, whoops, sorry, uh, is much more, uh, the Oliver Ranch Road, you know, as you're heading south, the Oliver Ranch Road kind of heads back north up to those wineries, uh, and uh, it's just adjacent to the bird banding station. Uh, that land is owned by the by the Nature Trust. It has some good examples of sort of mid middle aged uh, animal brush plants, and you can see them from the highway. It's kind of distinctive; they're blackish color uh, on the hillside there. So, uh, and obviously there's there's a number of other places. Uh, so, I'm gonna end this part with the notion that this is more than a species. It's actually an ecosystem in itself. Uh, having so many associations with so many different creatures and uh, weather elements and fire and so on that you know, I think it's a good example of how to sort of, we need to, we have this species myopia sort of, that, that it's just okay in and of itself, but this thing is so wired into the ecosystem that it, it doesn't make sense to think of it as simply just a species. It's a, it's a community. Uh, so I'm going to end with uh, a, a, uh, short section about animal brush from this book that uh, just came out last year. Uh, the first mention I've found for animal brush in the Okanagan is from the journals of that indefatigable traveler, George Mercer Dawson. This is how he describes the country to the north of present day Osuyus. And I quote, the valley, a huge, wide, flat bottom trough with no timber, scanty bunch grass, etc., and open thickets of ragged looking chaparral, giving it a weird and strange aspect. So chaparral is something that you would find in Mexico or Nevada, but I'm guessing that that was antelope brush, possibly sage, but I'm guessing it was antelope brush. Uh, so this is back to Frederick Persh. The tridentative part of the shrub's scientific name made sense to me, but the origin of the genus name Persia kept gnawing at my curiosity until I looked it up. Frederick Persh, born in 1774, a young German botanist, recently emigrated to Philadelphia and was working for Benjamin Smith Barton, 
an eminent doctor, philosopher, philosopher, botanist, and egomaniac. Lewis and Clark had just returned from their famous expedition, and on Thomas Jefferson's recommendation, they entrusted their entire dried plant collection to Barton to identify and catalog. Barton was too busy advancing his, his own credentials in various fields, so the work devolved to humble Frederick Perch. And among the samples was an unknown shrub that William Clark had collected as the expedition traveled along the Blackfoot River in northwestern Montana. Perch named the shrub Tigarea tridentata. The word Tigarea is barbarous, meaning that it has no meaning other than cigar in Romanian. <laughs> After finishing the Lewis and Clark work, Perch moved to Montreal to undertake a flora of Canada. Perch's entire collection burned in a fire and he died as a penniless alcoholic at age 46. The botanical community posthumously renamed the shrub Persia in his honor. Botany surely has its share of human drama. In one, one antelope, antelope brush paper I read, the author called the shrub a post-Pleistocene relic, implying that it does not fit the modern climatic era. I refuse to accept that and instead see it as an ecological elder, a holder of vast post-Pleistocene wisdom. The Silk people have their own stories about antelope brush. We honkies have virtually none, and we need them. The only one I could find was written by the local settler Isabella McNaughton in the 1940s, which was actually adapted from an original Silk story. And here's the snippet, and she calls it greasewood instead of animal breath. Greasewoods carry cheer enough to brighten all the hill. Greasewood bloom is neat and gay, like elf lamps burning high, like little yellow candle wicks alight against the sky. As a settler looking for my own nature bonds, I wonder if antelope brush could become my spirit creature. It would fit nicely with my emerging philosophy of honky agnostic land-based mysticism. I can envision my spirit ceremony. It would happen on a solstice. I would first perform a preparatory sauna cleanse at Penticton's Recreation Center and then I would proceed to a thoughtful hillside together with senior botanists, aging hippies, and the spirit of the West. The back of my ceremonial motorcycle jacket would be embroidered with antelope brush images, the shrub in profile, a three-fingered leaf, the Western harvest mouse, a pear-shaped seed, a flame, a hair streak, and a root nodule. As the ceremony concludes, a sacrificial bow of antelope brush is laid across my outstretched forearms. I am more than half serious about this. This ancient antelope brush I stand next to, and that's the one you saw the picture of, has been waiting patiently in order to speak its peace. Engage with me, it says unlock my ecological secrets, stand with me, write my stories, and give me standing. In return, I will be the patient recipient of your confused, honky, settler yearnings. Together, we will abide. Thank you. <laughs>